Visit the Arthur Zinkel Music Center to see rehearsals for a world premiere by composer Richard Daniel Poor. Bill Cole talks about his nonprofit, Horns for Haiti, and catch a performance by Sam Torres. It's all ahead on this episode of AHA, A House for Arts. Funding for AHA has been provided by your contribution and by contributions to the WMHT Venture Fund. Contributors include the Leo Cox Beach Philanthropic Foundation, Chet and Karen Alpelka, Robert and Doris fisher Melisardi, and the Robeson Family Foundation. At m and Bank, we understand that the vitality of our communities is crucial to our continued success. That's why we take an active role in our community. m and Bank is pleased to support WMHT programming that highlights the arts, and we invite you to do the same. I'm Matt Rogowitz, and this is AHA, a house for arts, a place for all things creative. Today we're celebrating the power of music. First up, we're heading to the Arthur Zankel Music Center at Skidmore College in Saratoga Springs to learn about Grammy award-winning composer Richard Daniel Poor's new work, The Unhealed Wound. The Arthur Zenkel Music Center is a fabulous venue that opened in 2010. It's a really premier space for presenting predominantly music in all forms. It is tunable acoustically. It's a gorgeous space with fabulous internal materials and external views. It allows Skidmore College to bring phenomenal musical talent to Saratoga Springs. Today is the world premiere of a Skidmore Commission song cycle by guest artists who we've brought to the college under the auspices of the McCormick Artist Scholar Residency, which is now in its 20th year. We are thrilled to have Grammy award-winning composer Richard Daniel Poor premiering his score, which is set to poems by Pulitzer Prize winning U.S. former poet laureate Rita Dove's work. I was in lockdown, as many of us were in the middle of 2020. And it was shortly after the George Floyd incident had occurred on the West Coast, I was living and I heard about this. And then I heard that following that incident, 200 protesters were arraigned in Jackie Robinson Stadium of all places on my campus where I teach at UCLA. And I was more than annoyed by this and Rita Dove and I had just almost finished a major 70-minute work called The Standing Witness that was supposed to be performed at Tanglewood and then got rescheduled as everything else did. And I called her and I said, do you have any poems that speak to this? event and this time in which racism and anti-Semitism, but I was thinking more about racism, seems to have reared its ugly head once again in, in full frontal display. Richard came to me and said, we really uh, need to do something else, something more. And I felt that urge too. I felt that given with Black Lives Matter, with all the things that were happening, uh, that the helplessness and wanting to do something to address what I felt had been festering all along. And so when Richard said, I'm thinking of a song cycle called, you know, The Unhealed Wound, I immediately clicked with that and I thought, yes, that's exactly what the title should be. 
The problem was that I was in the middle of doing a lot of other things, and I said, Richard, I, I'm not going to be able to write any poems exactly for this, but I have been writing these poems for quite a while uh, during uh, the pandemic. So I sent him the poems that I had been writing about this and said, does any of this work? And he said, okay. He was off and running then. She sent me a group of nine or 10 I set to music the texts of seven of them. Some of them are, are, are a setting verbatim of the actual poem. They're remarkable in that these poems can exist completely on their own, but they also work beautifully as a text to be set to music. It's very exciting uh, to see how others would interpret the rhythm of the poems and breathe into it. My hope always is, if, if someone is going to set something to music, that they can hear it too. Now, I think that Richard had already proven that he heard it too. And what I find fascinating about this particular piece, it's exciting, because he not only hears those rhythms, but he, it's almost like you will riff on something and say, oh, what about this? And I'll say, yeah, that's pretty good. The other interesting thing, too, is that I had thought about the instrumentation of this, and I liked the idea of having a solo obbligato cello with piano, because I discovered around the same time that we had discussed this new piece, I had discovered that Rita had been a cellist. And so this idea of a wordless witness accompanying the singers who share their experience, I thought was more than appropriate. If I rest my, my experience has been so eye-opening. I believe that working with Richard Daniel Poor and Rita both um, has been so great to actually get to work with them in person. I feel that each piece pays homage to a different part of the Black experience here in America, um, but also just an experience of how we celebrate life and how we manage to um, deal with things like grief and deal with anger and rage and pain, um, but even celebration of life and reverence, and all of that can be found in today's work. One of the great advantages, I guess you could say, or magic tricks of music is that it can soothe us even as it is, is opening up, for instance, a vein. And, of, and it's particularly when it comes to songs, something that has words with it as well. I'm hoping that the audience will be able to look at uh, what I, I guess I, you could say is the elephant in the room, the elephant in the room in, in all of our lives, without shame, without defensiveness, but to realize that it's visible, that we all recognize it. The music itself is both heartbreaking and utterly beautiful. So that, whew, that, that, that difficult, truth, I guess you could say, is, is made soothing because we are, after all, human and we keep striving to do better. So all of those things are going to be in there if they feel moved by this and come away feeling that we can do better, then I'm happy. Bill Cole is the owner of Cole's Woodwind Shop in Saratoga Springs. 
And he also runs a not-for-profit called Horns for Haiti, which provides musical instruments to schools in Haiti and teaches individuals how to fix and maintain them. Jade Warwick spoke with Bill to learn more. Hi, Bill. Welcome to AHA, Aha today. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah, excited to talk to you about all your endeavors and all your passions. So to begin, I know you're a musician, so I wanted to see, do you actually play any instruments? Or what instruments do you play, knowing that you're a musician? Well, I, I play all well, the woodwind instruments, mm -hmm. nothing professionally. <laughs> so when, when I fix an instrument, it is my living, I fix the instruments and I play them. And so after I'm done fixing it, I'll play test it, make sure it plays plays well, and then always leave the final test up to the customer. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. And speaking of customers, I know you own a music shop. That's one of your main endeavors. Can you give us a little bit of background on like how this music shop came to existence, your services, why it's so important for the community? I'll go right back to the beginning. And when I was graduating from high school, my music teacher found out I wasn't going to college for music. And she was... Um, she was concerned. She knew music was a big part of my life in, in high school, and she encouraged me. In fact, she demanded to, <laughs> in the middle of a lesson to go into the guidance office and look at the brochures for different um, music colleges. Um, well, I came across a brochure for um, SUNY Morrisville and uh, a two-year program called Music Instrument Technology, where they, they teach woodwind, brass, and string repair. And so I thought that kind of sounded nice. I, you know, I, I, I liked fixing things, and I was good with my hands. So um, uh, because of her encouragement, um, and her name was Margaret Coker, she was a worldly woman. Uh, she, she was all of, like 22 years old, so she was like um, <laughs> somebody I looked up to. You know, she was the, uh, an, an older person, and, and I an really elder. looked up to her. <laughs> yes, my elder at 22 <laughs> years old. Uh, I being 17 years old at the time, um, you know, took her advice and I called the college. Wow. After I graduated, I had my diploma in hand and I went to every music store in the Capital District here and nobody hired me. Mm. So that was, that was unexpected. I figured if I had a diploma, I would get a job, right? Well, uh, so I opened up a shop temporarily. So 46 years later, I still don't have a job. <laughs> But I have a wonderful shop that my wife and I, we raised our four children and now we have five grandchildren. So um, you can imagine the journey yeah. from that, that, that first um, a day of opening up the shop and, and, and everything in between. So I know you have an amazing program called Horns for Haiti and I want to talk a little bit about that. So can you give us some history on the program? Sure. Um, my shop has been all over the place and I, I would move from a location, a location. But back in the 80s, it was on 19th Street in Waterville. And it was a, a small, tiny little shop. And, and um, we were we are very in close proximity to St. John's Episcopal Church in Troy. So they were just right over the bridge in, in Troy. And so they knew about my shop. And they also have a sister parish in Las Cajobos, which is up in the mountains in Haiti. And so they would frequently go down there with their, their church mission. and and sometimes bring instruments down. If a, a parishioner donated an instrument, well, they would bring it over to my shop. And would you, you know, check it over and, you know, we'd play it and make sure it was okay, throw a couple of reeds in the case, make sure everything was cool, and then they would carry it down to Haiti. And so um, in 2014, the director for that program uh, approached me at my shop, which is now under Cafe Lena um, in Saratoga Springs, and, and she said, you know those instruments we sent down, where well, they're all in disrepair. Um, mm. And um, you know, it was kind of sad, and she was sad about it. So I said, I'll just go down there and fix them. Kind of like go off the cuff. And she said, would you? So I went home and discussed it with, with my wife, and as it turned out, in, in the next April, um, I went down with their mission. Only one time I was gonna go, just one time. and. I figured I'd fix some instruments, show the teacher how to do some minor repairs, call it a day, and have some stories to tell. Well, it didn't work out that way because the, the teacher was there, the music teacher. I met him, um, Maestro Markins. Um, there was a translator there, Rodney Jante, and six young men from the high school, from Holy Spirit High School in Los Cajobos, uh, who attended the workshop. Those young men were, were so brilliant, so engaged, 
they were better than any apprentice I think I've ever had in my shop. It's mm. just the way they were picking up things. And this is, of course, with, you know, with a um, language barrier. Mm -hmm. So I decided I, I have to come back. And then when I was on, on the plane back to JFK, I was just thinking about it, just processing everything that, all this wonderful stuff that has happened. And that's when I came up with the idea, Horns for Haiti. And why do you think this is important for the Haitian community, having a program like Horns for Haiti available? Well, first of all, music is huge in Haiti. Um, and you wake up in the morning, the roosters are crowing, it's be like four or five <laughs> o'clock in the morning, the dogs start barking, and then the churches, the music comes out of the churches, all well, the choirs, they're all rehearsing. And so that begins the day musically. Uh, for me, for, it's just me yeah. taking this all in, and the motorcycles going by the compound, and, and they all have music blaring off the back of their motorcycles. So it's a no-brainer for me to come down uh, or to go down to Haiti and, and support what they have already have been doing. Two of the six um, men that you were mentoring or under your apprenticeship actually opened up a shop. Do you want to give us a little bit more details about that shop? Well, um, we, we were talking about it for a long time, and, and I would, every time I would go down there, I would encourage them, you know, this, is a, this would be a good business because there's a lot of non-for-profits in Haiti. Mm -hmm. You could tap into them. There are also, um, right near the Dominican Republic, there's just a half an hour from the border and there's a lot of tourism in Dominican Republic. So I said, start a shop. People will, will find out who you are and what you're doing and the musicians will seek you out because that's what happened to me. It, it was 2020, right at the start of, um, the, of COVID, they called me up, or excuse me, they didn't call me, they emailed me, they couldn't call me, and, and said we started a shop. And I said, well, okay, great, name it, let's go, let's, <laughs> let's brand it right away, okay? You name it, um, you get some business cards, you start, you know, just let's, act, let's do this professionally. And so they got back to me and they said, um, we named a shop. And I said, well, what is it? And they said, um, Shop Billy. And I said, no, no, you don't name it after me. You name it after you or your family. And they, and they said, no, professor, we don't name it after you. We name it after your son. So they named it after my son. And they said, because you teach your son and someday we're gonna teach our son. And so it was more of a concept shop, Billy, or what they say, Billy shop, translated. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's the concept we're going to teach our our sons and daughters how to, and then they'll teach their sons and daughters and it'll go on and on yeah, and on. pass the knowledge on, yes. keep it going. how wonderful is that? That is a no. very wonderful. Well, thank you for all you do. So before we wrap up, I wanna let audience know, like what are some events and programs you may have coming up where they could either volunteer or donate or be involved somehow? Well, the Saratoga community and beyond has, has been great for in, um, donating instruments, okay? Uh, if, if they're in disrepair, we'll either fix them or we'll send them down to Billy shop and they'll fix them so they'll be fixed and, and in the hands of kids within within a year or so well thank you bill i appreciate that and folks donate <laughs> definitely try to donate some instruments and help this amazing nonprofit out and thank you bill for taking the time to talk my to pleasure. us today appreciate my you pleasure. please welcome sam torres
Thanks for joining us. For more arts, visit wmht.org slash aha and be sure to connect with us on social. I'm Matt Rogowitz. Thanks for watching. Funding for AHA has been provided by your contribution and by contributions to the WMHT Venture Fund. Contributors include the Leo Cox Beach Philanthropic Foundation, Chet and Karen Alpelka, Robert and Doris fisher Melisardi, and the Robeson Family Foundation. At m and Bank, we understand that the vitality of our communities is crucial to our continued success. That's why we take an active role in our community. MIT Bank is pleased to support WMHT programming that highlights the arts and we invite you to do the same.